Okay, so now that we have the EREPs for the BH3 molecule, um, specifically the H3 group orbitals, that gives us, as you recall, A1 prime plus E prime. And now we have to work through the procedure that's going to be necessary to visualize um, what these H3 group orbitals look like. And from inspection, you sort of immediately know that A1 prime is going to be totally symmetric. Um, so it's not really much of a surprise to illustrate that as um, three equally filled um, S-like orbitals in terms of their shape. But we get to the E prime, E rep, and we immediately have a problem. Well, the, the first thing is, is we know that um, these are going to have to actually possess the properties of, of Y um, or X, and they're going to be degenerate. So we have to sort of work through how that's actually going to be possible. And this is a very straightforward procedure, but it requires a little bit of, of detail. So let's um, get started to figure out what are the combinations going to be of those 1s orbitals that then completes this set of group orbitals. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to use the projection operator method, which we did use subtly in chapter four, if you remember to effectively define the symmetric and anti-symmetric stretching vibrations um, that are characteristic in water. Um, but here we're gonna actually apply it now, instead of to vectors, we're gonna apply this to the object itself. And it will be pretty straightforward because we're only dealing with 1s orbitals in this particular problem. So what we're going to figure out is from doing this, we'll be able to get the salts, which are again the symmetry adapted linear combination. Um, but let's first generate this to illustrate that we can produce exactly that object from the projection operator method to illustrate that we can do this one by inspection as we've done numerous times before because it's totally symmetric and it's obvious what the answer is going to be. But let's actually work through this systematically using the projection operator method in conjunction with the D3H character table. So the, the thing that's going to change in this particular approach is that we have to now select one of the um, H1s atomic orbitals. So you basically select just one of those. And then we're going to determine how it actually transforms. But this is where we're going to change the game a little bit under every single possible symmetry operation of the point group. So now we have to specifically define not just classes, but every operation within the class very carefully, which again is the whole reason why you need to have your axes and your structure incredibly well defined to do this properly. So what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm defining each of the H's um, or each of the H atoms and their 1s orbitals and I'm actually identifying them separately. So the one on the top is called HA, and then the one on the left is HB, and the one on the right, bottom right, is HC. And what we're going to do in this approach is, if you remember where we have everything laid out, so the y-axis is actually right along the bond between the boron and the HA atom. And then the x-axis is going in that direction, so we sort of know exactly um, where everything lies in space. And then remember, the c3-axis is still um, projecting out of the screen towards you. And I'm going to do all of these um, rotations are always going to be counterclockwise, as I 
already specified before. So what we're doing here is this is giving you the answers of what happens if I select this particular group orbital here, or sorry, this particular um, 1s orbital, and I subject it to all of the operations within the point group. And as you can see now, this is illustrating the full individual operations and we're breaking them up, even separating them uh, into individual operations, which is the first time we've ever done this. So um, now everything is, is basically gonna be pretty straightforward to explain from this point forward. Um, so let me start by just clearing out some of my markings here because I want to be very clear cut about what we're what it is we're going to do here. Okay. And what ultimately has to happen is we have to show you how every single one of these operations is going to result in the answers that are shown um, under each of those headed columns. So let's just work through this. So if we project HA under the identity operation, it actually stays as itself. That's why it's HA. The C3 rotation, as I said, we're gonna, we're gonna do everything very systematically here. The C3 rotation, sticking with the fact that it's counterclockwise, you can see HA will turn into HB under the C3 operation. If you do the C3 operation twice, you'll see that that moves HA to HB, but then it's gonna move HB over to the position where HC is. So if you see that this is C3 squared, it's basically C3 followed by C3, HA becomes HC under that um, operation. Now um, I'm defining very distinctively where you would locate all of those particular mirror planes um, and all of the C2 axes in this molecule. So, so C2A is going to be um, this particular axis. And then as you can see, C2B is going to run through there. And then C to C will run through there. And this can get a little messy, so I'm gonna kind of clear my, I'm just gonna clear my markings so we can kind of start over here. Um, but if you've already recognized, so we work through right now, all of these operations pretty, pretty, pretty much as, as you've already seen. So now if we do a C2 operation here, um, around A, obviously A stays fixed and, and B and C will interchange, but that doesn't matter because we're just projecting HA. And we're only concerned about what happens to HA. So if you do that same rotation, um, the C2 rotation in, uh, you know, basically the uh, C2 around B, you can see that HA and HC will interchange and that gives you HC. And then if we then if we do the same exact procedure where now we're going to run this through HC, which is right through there, um, effectively the, the same thing um, that you would expect would happen is if you do that rotation, you're going to wind up interchanging those and then that means HA becomes HB. So clearing the markings again, then we're now at sigma H, which is a little bit easier because that basically leaves everything fixed. So HA stays as, as HA here, as, um, as indicated. Then um, the S3 rotation, remember this is going to be a C3 rotation. So that's the C3. And then that's going to be followed by a reflection through a plane that's perpendicular to that. So it's just going to retain the position of HB, and that's where that happens. So um, finally, if you do the S2 rotation, remember we just did this. It's a, a C3 and a C3, um, or effectively doing this, doing that twice. 
um, but you can kind of see the net result of that. It's just going to position HA in the position of HC, and then reflection through the mirror plane still gives it um, HA will become HC. And then, of course, sigma V um, is going to be running, you know, anything that runs down through um, A keeps it as A. If it runs down through B, like shown there, you can see that HA and HC will interchange, and that's why you get HC there. And then finally, if you look down the other axis here, you will see that if you rotate through there, HA and HB will um, flip positions. So HA becomes HB. And there we have it. So that is the full blown um, projection operators applied to what happens to HA as a, re as a result of applying every single operation within the point group. So that's the hardest step in this whole process. Now, all we have to do to complete the exercise for the, uh, for the A1 prime EREP is now we have to take all of those um, projections in each of those operations, and then we just have to multiply them by the characters that are found in the EREP, um, and in this particular case, it's the EREP for A1 uh, prime. And A1 prime obviously is totally symmetric, so all of those numbers are one. So you can kind of see the net result of this. It's, it's basically HA times one gives you HA, HB times one gives you HB, HC times one gives you HC, and then HA uh, times one gives you HA, HC times one gives you HC, and HB times one gives you HB, and I don't think I need to reiterate, but that's what you're doing all the way across this entire series here. Then um, you sum all of these up, and you'll see that this gives you now um, a projection that tells you what contribution of each of these atomic orbitals is actually going into the molecular orbitals. So here, what it's telling you is, is that you have equal um, magnitudes of HA, HB, and HC that are contained in this orbital. So that tells you that this particular molecular orbital or group orbital that you generated has effectively the same weighting from, from HA, which remember is here, HB, which is here, and HC. So they have equal magnitude, so they're gonna be equal in size and shape, and therefore totally symmetric. 